Hello, this is Manuel Barthes from Institute de Recherche en Cancérologie de Montpellier in France. And this is a fourth of a series of five lectures on radiopharmaceutical dosimetry. It's uh, prepared under the IAEA Technical Cooperation Program, and that's a project Paul 9025. That lecture is about to discuss the relevance of uh, clinical dosimetry in nuclear medicine in diagnostic, but mostly in uh, therapy. So for diagnostic dosimetry, I will not spend a lot of time on it. There's a specific lecture that was dedicated to diagnostic dosimetry. We just add that documenting the irradiation, especially the low irradiation delivered by diagnostic radiopharmaceutical is important. It's a by law. It's something that has to be done before the radiopharmaceutical gets the approval and can be put on the market by FDA or EMA. So it's essentially model-based dosimetry according to ICRP recommendation, meaning pooling the pharmacokinetic on based on several patients, healthy volunteers extrapolated from animal, but having a reference pharmacokinetic for the radiopharmaceutical and that used as an input in a reference dosimetric model in order to ensure traceability to derive the absorbed doses in tissues and absorbed dose per megabec injected for that reference uh, examination, I would say. In fact, it's uh, mostly in a therapeutic context that dosimetry is essential. So if we're looking back, backward, uh, this is one of the first papers presenting radioactive iodine therapy, what we call now molecular radiotherapy, by Sedlin et al. And that was presented in 1946. And this is what Sedlin uh, did. They used iodine-131 and iodine-130 that has now completely disappeared in different activities to treat metastasis of thyroid cancer. They tried to derive absorbed doses using external counting to the tumor, to the blood. They also measured uh, the uptake using a tracer activity before the therapy. And they use a white blood cell count and the blood and cholesterol and different markers and the weight uh, along the three different injections. So they actually fractionated the treatment in three different injections. So this is what my uh, colleague Glenn Flux summarized by saying, OK, there was a tracer study. There was absorbed dose calculated biomarkers of response. It was a cocktail treatment. Miss, um, uh, that used uh, two different isotopes. And there was interval treatment because it was a fractionated in free fraction treatment. So the conclusion of my colleague is that molecular radiotherapy went steadily downhill from there. Why that sort of provocative conclusion? Well, in uh, 2010, a British survey established that almost all the therapeutic nuclear medicine treatments are delivered according to fixed activity. So thyroid ablations treated with 3.7 to 7.4. So it's a factor two activity, but depending on, well, not necessarily the patient, but depending mostly on the center, it's, the treatment is being de um, delivered. Neuroendocrine tumors could be treated all over the United Kingdom by uh, lutetium octreotate or yttrium 90 octreotate or MIBG sometimes with different activities. Bone metastasis could be treated by samarium 153 or strontium 89 or rhenium 186 or now radium chloride uh, 223. So basically, the conclusion was it's a radionuclide raffle because obviously, this is not, I mean, as a patient you will not get the treatment because that's the most appropriate treatment. You'll get treated by different radionuclides depending the hospital you're going to go, right? Which is why it's a raffle. So the ENM survey performed by the dosimetry task group, task force, sorry, in 2017 led to basically the same conclusion with a possibly a more spread um, 
quantitatively, I mean, more dosimetry, more clinical dosimetry being performed all over Europe, but still most treatments are being delivered according to fixed activity or activity divided by the mass of a patient. So this is a problem because it means that the treatment by fixed activity is not designed, is not conceived for a given patient, but it's considered for a sort of one size fits all treatment. And if that's good for the patient, it's good. If it's not good, then we can't help it. And this was observed even as early as 1953 in that uh, paper that says that some of the attempts to treat metastatic cancer of thyroid with radioactive iodine were without therapeutic effect, probably because we were satisfied with minimal, even poor uptake of the isotope by the metastatic lesion. So as early as 1953, it was already observed that sometimes just, you know, administering a fixed activity and just looking what happens may not be fully satisfactory. In fact, this is where we're coming from. So in another therapeutic context, this is extracted from a book of 1953 and what we can see here, and I'm going to translate in, in, in current um, English. So a great many side factors of a particular nature will influence the choice of initial activity. So it's not those, obviously. All of them quite obvious to the clinician when he's presented with a particular patient. It is wise to give a minimum effective activity in a young patient. Add a few megadecrel if the symptoms are severe, double the activity if the heart is badly damaged, subtract megabecrel, some megabecrel if a patient is already overweight, add a couple of megabecrel if a patient lives out of tongue, or if a patient's doctor is dubious of the value of a treatment. <laughs> this was therapy planning. Uh, it was written in a book in 1953. So in fact, when we look at molecular radiotherapy administration, we have two paradigms. The first one is that of chemotherapy. So the amount of drug, which here is activity, is administered as a fixed number or per mass of body weight or by surface area, leading to megabec, megabec per kilogram, megabec per meter square. And with a maximum activity defined during the phase one clinical trial. So in a phase one clinical trial, you normally increase the amount of drug that is delivered. So here you increase the activity until you reach toxicity. And then you decide that the posology, the activity that must be administered to all patients is just under that threshold where side effects start to appear. The problem with that approach is that side effects start to appear with, well, for the weakest patients. And some patients could stand probably much higher activity. The fact is that with quantitative imaging, we are most often able to follow the fate of a drug inside a patient. So we can do pharmacokinetic studies, patient specific, and we can try to compute and we can compute the absorbed dose delivered to every single patient. So we can use dosimetry, quantitative imaging and dosimetry to make the patient much uh, treated in a much more specific way. Um, and then the conclusion is, if we are using fixed activity based on the weakest patient, we are going to undertreat a large fraction of patients. Then there's a radiotherapy paradigm saying, well, molecular radiotherapy and which is why it's being called, you know, molecular radiotherapy. It's a radiotherapy. So the effect is induced by ionizing radiation. It can be monitored individually. It should be optimized individually. And so we can use the objective index, that is the absorbed dose, to document and optimize the therapy delivered on a patient-specific base. So this is a radiotherapy paradigm. And basically, in the clinical practice of nuclear medicine these days, there's an ongoing discussion, not to say ongoing fight, between those who consider that molecular radiotherapy is a systemic radiotherapy. So we put the accent on radiotherapy. So the absorbed dose should be calculated and the treatment should be patient-specific based on the dosimetry. 
And those who say that this is a radioactive chemotherapy, and so it should be delivered according to the rules implemented in chemotherapy. So you can see here a list of paper. Uh, the first paper by Chiesa was basically advocating the fact that it's okay for Emma to give the authorization of a product, so it's basically referring to Lutatera, so lutetium-177 octreotate, that was put on the market with fixed activity. So Carlo Chiesa was saying it's, it's fine, as long as it's explicitly said in the radiopharmaceutical notice uh, that it is possible to change the activity as long as a uh, specific dosimetry is being performed. And probably even that was too much. So there was a paper by Gianmarile who say, well, no, this is radioactive chemotherapy. So this treatment is not a radiotherapy, it's a chemotherapy. And that's called an answer by Glenn Flux and is still ongoing. So I would like to stress and to quote uh, an American colleague who tried to put together the pro and con of uh, patient-specific dosimetry. So there is something that I believe is very, very true. And it was said uh, in 2007 by George Guros in a GNM paper. He said, we're not doing dosimetry for the sake of doing dosimetry. We're not doing dosimetry by pleasure. We're doing dosimetry because it's useful and because it allows optimizing the treatment. And in order to reach that objective, the objective of dosimetry in targeted radionuclide therapy is to provide information that will help improve patient care. We want to optimize the therapy. So with that objective in mind, the absorbed dose, and I'm not saying estimate, we're not doing estimation. We're computing absorbed doses with uncertainties. It's a different thing. Absorbed dose is useful to the extent that it relates to response. So yes, this is very important. It really means that we physicists, cannot neglect, cannot stop the calculation at the absorbed dose stage. We have to try to relate the absorbed dose, which is an objective index that we can calculate with uncertainties, with the observed effect, clinical effect, biological effect. And we have to establish the absorbed dose effect relationship, ADEO. So in 2007, there was a paper by the therapy committee of the ENM entitled Clinical Radionuclide Therapy Dosimetry, the Quest for the Holy Gray. Um, and these were nuclear medicine physicians. And their conclusion was that the data in the literature that underscore the potential of dosimetry is very scarce. So basically no absorbed dose effect relationship observed. In 2014, the dosimetry committee of the ENM published a paper so that was seven years after, where the conclusion was that the evidence strongly implies a correlation between the absorbed dose and the responses. So it means that it, within seven years, there's been a massive improvement in the number of studies that actually observed an absorbed dose effect relationship. Not that all of them are put, uh, I mean, are used to optimize the therapy or to modulate the administered activity. Most of these studies are just following what occurs after uh, fixed activity, activity administration. But we know that because the pharmacokinetics are varying from one patient to the next, administering the same activity to different patients will lead to different absorbed doses. And these can be put in conjunction with the observed effect to see if the absorbed dose increases with, I mean, the effect increases with the absorbed dose, both for toxicity and for efficacy. So what these two papers uh, show is that we actually have a two-side equation. In absorbed dose effect relationship, one is the absorbed dose and it can be quantified. It's a physics objective index, as I said before. Whereas, and, but the other one should not be neglected. The way the effect is documented, how reliable, how, you know, how objective is the effect observed, that too is going to condition the absorbed dose effect relationship. In other words, we have two, para, two, two variables, the absorbed dose and the effect, and they cannot be separated. So, this is here, the, this is more detailed here. We have the absorbed dose effect relationships. It's a two-side equation. 
and we cannot consider the two parameters independently. So the question is what effects, I mean, we know how to do the dosimetry. We've seen that in the previous lectures. So what effects are we looking for? And the first question is, are we interested in efficacy or toxicity documentation? Because that may condition what follows in terms of therapy. For example, if we are interested in efficacy, then the question is which, you know, how high absorbed dose is going to kill a tumor. And if we know the absorbed dose that is needed to eradicate the tumor, then we can modulate the activity to reach that absorbed dose threshold. It's a parallel with external beam radiotherapy and the concept of treatment planning. So we may try to have a first preliminary idea of how much absorbed dose is delivered to the tumor uh, by megabec, and then adjust the number of megabec to treat uh, and to get a certain number of gray. Then the other approach is to focus on toxicity and is to assess which absorbed dose is going to induce damage to kidney, to bone marrow, to lungs, to you name it. Uh, and then the idea is to keep the activity administered just below that threshold. So it's somehow inject as much as possible because by doing so, we're going to increase activity, uh, efficacy, but just by, we keep the activity just below the threshold of toxicity. So the paradigm is now as high as safely attainable or AHASA. So if we look at what we've been saying so far, the absorbed dose effect relationship that is conditioned by how well the absorbed dose is calculated, the accuracy or uncertainty associated to absorbed dose uh, calculation. And that's a garbage in garbage out principle. But also it depends on how well the endpoint is defined. And then, and, and I say that for physicists uh, in, in the audience, it's very important to go beyond absorbed dose calculation. Because the analogy that we're making with external beam radiotherapy may not be relevant in nuclear medicine therapy. First of all, we know that molecular radiotherapy may be most effective on small diffuse disease. And if it's small to the extent that it cannot be quantified, I mean, we cannot have a volume because it's infraclinical target. We only have uh, the markers that, you know, like PSA is, is becoming high. So we know the cancer is here. We know it's the right moment to treat, but we do not have a target volume to define. So we cannot compute the absorbed dose to the tumor. It's just that simple. So if we have no tumor visible, we cannot compute the absorbed dose to the tumor. Uh, the other thing is, what if uh, we have multiple targets? Because that's the case, if you see the treatment of neuroendocrine tumors with uh, Lutathera, for example, unfortunately, you have patients with dozens uh, of uh, tumors. So setting the activity on the absorbed dose to deliver to a tumor, which one? the one that uptakes or the one that does not uptake. So it may not be easy to do as is done in external beam radiotherapy, uh, plan the treatment for delivering that many gray to a specific tumor volume. Um, and in the same line, I mean, it may be the case that with the current administration way, uh, the current administration paradigm that is based on chemotherapy where we administer activity that is well below the threshold of uh, toxicity, then if we do not observe toxicity, there is no way we can document the absorbed dose toxicity curve because we just have the absorbed dose and it's well below the appearance of the toxicity. So all this to say that the, the, the analogy with external beam radiotherapy may not necessarily be relevant. And I say that because it's very important because most physicists are initially trained for external beam radiotherapy. So we're trying to um, use these concepts that apply in external beam radiotherapy to nuclear medicine. And in fact, they may not necessarily apply to nuclear medicine therapy. So let's go back to that, uh, that, dosim that uh, study by Lydia Strigari in 2014. It was initially a bibliographic search uh, based on 92 articles, 70, 
nine of them reported dosimetry, more than half reported an absorbed dose effect relationship. There was many more absorbed dose effect relationship than we were expecting. But then the problem is that those studies had a low to moderate clinical relevance according to NCI guideline definitions. In other words, for example, they were uh, interested in uh, if the tumor or one tumor is shrinking, which is one observation in terms of you know clinical efficacy, but it's not very high in the ranking of uh, the relevance uh, as defined by NCI. So I'm not going to cite all that paper or all the situation where absorbed dose effect relationship were observed. I'm just going to pinpoint some of them just to extract some, uh, some points that we can keep in mind for further analysis. So the first uh, reference I'd like to cite is that from the German team uh, that has been studying uh, differentiated thyroid cancer for decades. And uh, the conclusion they made by based on blood-based uh, blood dosimetry, they concluded that the absorbed dose to the blood as a surrogate to the absorbed dose to the patient uh, is a better predictor of ablation success than administered activity. So that's a very important point. It means that you cannot base your treatment on the same activity to everyone because there is something like patient-specific pharmacokinetics. So if you use absorbed dose to the blood, you can optimize your therapy for differentiated thyroid cancer. And basically at the same time, there's a British team that uh, based on imaging and based on the maximum voxel absorbed dose to thyroid remnants, which is a concept quite difficult to implement, nonetheless, they managed to sort between failed ablation and successful ablation on the absorbed dose delivered to the remnants. And so that's interesting because it's the same pathology, the same treatment of uh, you know, thyroid remnants and um, two different methodological approaches allow to discriminate failed versus successful ablations. So the conclusion is that it's not one single methodology to reach that objective to separate failed and successful ablation. A second uh, study I'd like to highlight is also from the same British team in Royal Marsden. And um, they have been studying the toxicity induced by MIBG treatment with iodine-131 MIBG for the therapy of neuroblastoma. And they based the dosimetry on something that is very crude in terms of methodology based on external counting on the patient. And they computed the so-called whole body absorbed dose. So somehow just considering that the activity counted by an external probe was homogeneously distributed in the patient, which by the way, negates completely the specificity of a treatment, right? but they had a whole body absorbed dose and they could establish that that whole body absorbed dose correlates quite well with the toxicity observed. And they use that to modulate the activity. And thanks to that very crude absorbed dose or that very crude clinical dosimetry procedure, if you wish, they managed to multiply the administered activity by a factor three without seeing toxicity based on these measurements. So that's very important because it means that sometimes a very simple dosimetry procedure will allow to optimize the therapy and to optimize a lot because a factor of three in administered activity is not nothing. Then two papers or two examples published basically at the same time by two Italian teams on the selective internal radiotherapy. So the treatment with iodine one, uh, sorry, with atrium 90 microspheres, one with glass microspheres and the other one with resin microspheres. And the authors were interested in toxicity to the liver. And so you can see the sort of the basic sigmoid shape of the, um, of a complication probability as a function of the absorbed dose. What is interesting is that here for Chiesa, using glass microspheres, 
the, the point of inflection in the curve was about 110 grays, more or less. And whereas uh, for Strigari, if you see at the top of the curve, you've got the whole lever, you've got that inflection point on less than 55 grays, about 50 grays. So half of that value. And so at first sight, you say, well, it's not, you know, if a gray is a gray, it's absolutely not possible that, you know, toxicity appears, uh, the inflection point is either 50 or more than 100 gray. There's probably something wrong here in the way, you know, the absorbed dose was calculated. And uh, truth is that there was no mistake. It's just that they both computed the average absorbed dose to the whole liver. And then when they refined their analysis, they realized that the glass spheres are big glass, big spheres with high activity and obviously low in number. Whereas the resin microspheres used by Strigari are very small spheres with a high number of spheres being delivered in the tumor. And therefore, in the later case, the distribution is much more homogeneous, meaning that for an average absorbed dose of 50 gray, you can ensure that most of the volume has received quite a high absorbed dose of 50 grays. Whereas for an absorbed dose, I mean, you have to increase the average absorbed dose to more than 100 gray if it's with glass microspheres in order to have the low irradiated parts of the liver receive enough irradiation to trigger toxicity. So basically the conclusion of that study, I mean, the comparison of these studies mean that the average absorbed dose can be okay, but not the relevant parameter to explain the biological effect in, in that case of toxicity. So the conclusions of the three studies or four studies I mentioned, first, there can be two approaches for the same treatment as was seen in the treatment of remnants for thyroid cancer. Then for what was seen for MIBG, in some situation, very simple approaches are sufficient to modulate the activity and improve, optimize the therapy. And then the third example was that for the same indication and the same endpoint, two products yield different absorbed dose threshold, but it means that you have to look after, I mean, be a little more refined and go to the ab ab absorbed dose distribution given a, a volume, a given volume. Um, but you know, in those three examples, the conclusion is also that the endpoint and the absorbed dose cannot be dealt with independently. Now I'm going to discuss how the protocol, the clinical protocol to establish the absorbed dose may condition the absorbed dose effect relationship. Uh, and the example is that of peptide receptor radionuclide therapy with yttrium 90 labeled peptide. And so it's a study from uh, sponsored initially by Novartis, and that was reported in 2000, uh, between 2003 and 2005 by the teams from uh, Erasmus Rotterdam and UCL Brussels. In that clinical study, a subset of 18 patients were selected to establish patient-specific dosimetry and to administer, to modulate the activity, to keep the absorbed dose to the kidney inferior to 27 gray. So very important, 17 patients, a first study, a first dosimetry study to assess the absorbed dose to the kidney. And that was used to modulate the activity to deliver less than 27 gray to the kidney. Then there was also efficacy and bone marrow toxicity assessed. But we're going to focus on kidney absorbed dose. So they used, because quantitative spec was uh, with a high level of uncertainty, they used yttrium 86, also because they could afford it. And uh, according to the, the principle of beta plus, beta minus pairs that I mentioned in a previous lecture. So as you can see here, yttrium 86 is a dirty isotope. And so the physicist, Stéphane Valerand, uh, had to design a full protocol to quantify, I mean, to correct the randoms 
and to quantify the activity with ITO86. They did that with four time points, and uh, they, that's a reference of the paper where the quantitative uh, imaging protocol is presented. Based on this, they extrapolated the activity for Itrium 90, which is difficult to image, and they computed the absorbed dose. Initially, they used MERDOS 3, and uh, this is uh, to a left a representation of the kidney according to MERDOS 3, but during the same time came the MERD pamphlet 19 with a new description of a kidney that was more refined. So in fact, for their study, they used uh, MERD pamphlet uh, 19 to get the absorbed dose. And there was a shift in the absorbed dose computed explaining that they had about 30 gray. So this first graph is obtained by taking MERD pamphlet 19 uh, model for the kidney. And I remind they had a first study to have um, pharmacokinetics specific to the patient with I3 or maybe 6 then computed the absorbed dose according to MERD pamphlet 19, and they modulate the activity to get 27 gray, and they got mostly 30 gray. Mind that there is one outlier, but aside of that, I mean, we can say that they did everything correctly, right? They aim for about 30 gray, and they got about 30 gray. But then you see to the, the y axis is a creatinine clearance loss per year. So that's an index of toxicity to the kidney. And then the issue with that is that despite the fact that most kidney received 30 gray, some patients had quite a high severe toxicity and some patients had no toxicity. So the conclusion at that stage of the study is that the absorbed dose does not correlate with the effect because for 30 gray, some patients will have toxicity and for the same 30 gray, some patients will not have toxicity. And so the, the Belgium colleagues, they went further. And I, I like that, uh, that study because it, it, it really, uh, it's an example of what should be done really. And they realized that not everybody has got the same kidney. So they did the absorbed dose correction according to the mass ratio, actually according to the volume ratio as explained to the, to the right and uh, as was described in the previous lecture. So you have to the right, the distribution of the volumes of the kidneys for male and female patient, the 18 patients enrolled in that trial. In the center, you have some image of I386 for two different patients. And you can see that obviously the kidneys do not have the same volume. So thinking backwards, what they did is they had a very patient specific pharmacokinetics and then they used the same kidney for all the patients. So the level of refinement of the dosimetry was not the same for the accumulated activity and for the S value determination. By doing the mass scaling or the volume scaling, as they did in a second stage, they realized that not all the patients received 30 grays, that some patients received from anything between 20 and 40 grays. And you can see here the scatter of the points in terms of absorbed dose when you refine and take into account the patient specific kidney volume. And you see a trend and you see a trend you know, and, and I agree, it's not you know, the best possible correlation, but you really see a trend that shows that when the absorbed dose increases, the chances to develop toxicity also increase. And they did further another refinement by computing not the absorbed dose that the BED, the biological effect, uh, effective dose, and according to um, biological parameter like the half-life for repair, you know, alpha on beta, uh, ratio and radiobiology used and coming from external beam radiotherapy. And you look at the results they get in terms of toxicity versus VED. And this now is a very nice correlation. So basically, this is the evolution between, uh, you know, from no absorbed dose effect relationship to a clear correlation based on the same patient, but by just refining the calculation. And uh, again, I like very much that paper uh, because it really shows the way to go 
when you want to to explain i mean if you really want to explain what's going on another example is given here about in the same study uh, um, uh, the different ways they had to evaluate the absorbed dose to bone marrow and uh, they found that if they were using the blood so remainder model or plasma model uh, they could not discriminate between patients with a uh, uh, developing toxicity or not. And it's only specific uptake measured uh, thanks to imaging using IG or 86 that allowed to identify a first outlier in red, as you can see, a, a red dot. And, uh, and they said that patient has a higher absorbed dose than the others, and they treated him nonetheless, and he developed toxicity. So the second patient in blue, that was also an outlier in terms of absorbed dose to the red marrow, was treated with reduced activity and did not develop toxicity. So the conclusion is so far that the dosimetric protocol has a great influence on the correlation between absorbed dose and effect. And um, I3M90 labeled vector is probably one of the most difficult situations because it's very difficult to image I3M90. So they had to use I3M86, that is a surrogate, very expensive emitter that is not available anywhere. Uh, some examples also have been seen in radioimmunotherapy on Zevalin by Ferrer et al. Uh, and I think we can safely say that the absorbed dose effect correlation can be put in evidence whenever it's looked for with a relevant approach. So what's the evolution? Well, the evolution is to have trials that are uh, with dosimetry. And one example is the Illuminet trial uh, that has been developed by Uni University of Lund. So that's a treatment of uh, uh, lutetium-177 dotatate, so lutatera, a treatment of neuroendocrine tumors, and it's based on kidney toxicity. So as a reminder, lutatera has been put on the market as a product that is administered with four administration of a fixed 7.4 gigabit head. So the patient will receive four times 7.4 gigabit health, unless the clinician fears for the status of a kidney, in which case the activity can be decided by the clinician, uh, decreased or even one shot or two shots can be suppressed. What the uh, Swedish colleagues did, they based their study on the absorbed dose to the kidney, the BED, in fact, to the kidney. And they defined two groups of patients, patients at risk and patients with no risk of complication to the kidney. Patients at risk were given as many 7.4 gigabit injections that can be administered before reaching that 77, 27 gray limit. The others could be given up to 40 gray because they had no uh, seen, no force in kidney complication. And look at the results. Take the first patient, patient 002. He received 4.8 gray to the first, to the kidney, to the first administration, 4.3, 4. 3.940. And normally the treatment should have stopped here. But thanks to uh, the administration based on the kidney absorbed dose, it could receive three extra administration of 7.4 gigabit each. And you can see that with exception, example patient 003, um, the, the absorbed dose received to the kidney is variable from one patient to the next, but for a given patient, it's quite predictable of what is going to happen in the other fractions. Another conclusion is that in terms of shots that were delivered to the patient, anything, you could see anything from three administration to seven and even eight and even nine, but it's non-published, um, nine uh, administration. I think now they went up to 10 for some patients. So thanks to the dosimetry based on two different thresholds, 27 or 40 gray, depending on the fact that the patient had additional risk to develop toxicity, they could move from the four times 7.4 gigabit, so 30 gigabit max, to n times 7.4 gigabit. And the n time here 
is 60 gigabytes, so it's more than the double. And in fact, they've gone up to, I mean, if you from three to nine, it's a factor of three in terms of activity administered. Just because the admin activity is modulated by the uh, absorbed dose delivered to the kidney. So this is, uh, and that was just the intermediary study, right? Um, so this is the frequency of uh, the number of cycles that were delivered. And in fact, the conclusion is that most patients, in fact, the majority of patients could receive more than the four cycles. Okay, that's a very important uh, uh, result. And then, because the previous study has not yet uh, reported on the efficacy, but this is the first study, as far as I know, where the correlation between the absorbed dose, I mean, the, the importance of patient-specific absorbed dose has been measured in terms of patient survival. So this is the dosisphere zero one study is comparing selective internal radiotherapy, so microspheres of yttrium 90 for the treatment of liver uh, metastasis. And the two arms are, one arm has got the standard dosimetry, so 120 gray to the perfuse level. The second arm has got personalized dosimetry, so the injection is modulated according to the objective of delivering 200 gray to the index lesion. And the conclusion is a significant, significantly different overall survival between the patients who benefited from a patient-specific dosimetry and those who did not. So, and you see 26.7 months overall survival versus 10.7 months of overall survival, depending on the arms where you are. So this is a clear high level evidence according to NCI uh, of the superiority of establishing a treatment based on patient specific observations and patient specific dosimetry. So the takeaway message, we've been browsing through different clinical approaches and you could see that various methodologies have been implemented for various clinical situations. And the takeaway message really should be that the fact that there is not a unique way of performing patient-specific dosimetry should not refrain us from doing what seems to be the most appropriate for a given radiopharmaceutical, for a given endpoint, so for a given pathology at a given time and with the available resources. And I think it's a very important message to convey to all of you. Do what you can at the moment with you know, the tools you have the only thing is work on traceability, work on documenting what you're doing so that possibly later on you can reprocess your data, reprocess your images, and always try to establish or to assess the uncertainties. And that really is the way to go to optimize uh, targeted radionuclide therapy using uh, dosimetry. So this was the fourth, that's the end of a fourth lecture on radiopharmaceutical dosimetry that was developed under the IAEA Tech Cooperation Program uh, with the project Paul 9025. Thank you.